Good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. I'm B. Rolat of the Cultural Events Team in the British Library, and I want to welcome you to the library, which is currently home to, well, lots of people finding refuge from the heat wave, but also to our current exhibition, Breaking the News, which explores five centuries of UK news from through a variety of different lenses. Today's very important event will take you behind the headlines on the war in Ukraine into some of the deeper undercurrents surrounding it. And who better to lead you on that journey than Natalia Antalava of Coda Story? So don't hesitate during this uh, event to send your questions in as they occur to you. There's space underneath here on the platform for you to submit your questions at any time and they'll be put to the speakers later on. Um, in the meantime, I'm handing over to you, Natalia. Thank you so much, V. Thank you. And Many thanks to all of you who are here with us. We can't see you, but we believe that you're here. Um, and I know those of you who are in the UK are braving the heat, which has done wonders to pushing Ukraine out of the headlines. So let's try to reverse that a little bit. Um, we have fantastic speakers with us today. Peter Pomerantsev is joining us from Prague. I believe he's just out of Ukraine or at least been going back and forth. Natalia Guminiuk is in Ukraine and Short Walker is in Budapest and all of their biographies are online so I'm not going to be going through their many many achievements um, before because I think it's much better to dive in but before we do I do want to reiterate what we just said please do send the questions as you think of them and we'll make sure to leave enough time to get to them. So I told you where everyone is. Myself, I'm Natalia Antalava and I'm in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, I am a co-founder of Coda Story, which is a newsroom that is dedicated to coverage of the root causes of global crises, exposing connections between them and their global ramifications. And we work quite differently from most mainstream newsrooms because our editorial process is very much built around the themes, the crises that we cover. And we try to bring context and continuity to, to the issues that you see in your news feeds and on the news. We're a very global team, but myself being Georgian, uh, this region is very much part of, part of CODA's DNA. And long before the world um, was shaken by the February 24th um, invasion of Ukraine, the new invasion of Ukraine, our team of reporters had been covering the very causes uh, behind the invasion, things like the rewriting of history in Vladimir Putin's Russia, the consolidation of authoritarians all around the world, the global memory wars. And a couple of months before Putin invaded, um, we had um, an honor of publishing a really great essay by Peter Pomerantsev called Memory in the Age of Impunity. So that's why that is in the title of today's session. And in that essay, he talked about the need for new thinking on what binds us across the world. Peter, so I want to start with you and maybe we can jump in if you could explain the very concept of this age of impunity and the connected storylines that you and I have talked so much about and um, explain it, especially in the context of the war in Ukraine. Um, so I suppose the, the essay started off with a question about memory. Why don't we remember things? Uh, it started actually when a Belarusian wrote to me and said, look, everyone's forgetting about Belarus. This was right after, um, right after, you know, this, this really like, really quite, quite flabbergasting moment when Lukashenko, the dictator of Belarus, forced down a Ryanair flight. I think it was Ryanair, pretty sure it was Ryanair. Uh, under false pretenses, basically, like as it traveled over Belarusian airspace, you know, the Belarusians forced it down, saying it was, there was a terrorism incident, and then dragged off this Belarusian dissident and his girlfriend who'd been living in the Baltics. And that's a huge deal. I mean, essentially, it's like completely acting like a terrorist state, like hijacking a commercial flight. And, and my friend wrote to me from Belarus saying, look, we're really worried this is going to be forgotten in a couple of weeks. And she was completely right. It was completely forgotten. And I just started thinking about like the agony of Syrians that I knew who would produce so much evidence about war crimes in, in Syria, just more evidence than we've ever had. And, and it just goes nowhere. It doesn't stay in, 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 in the public memory. And I was wondering, why is that? What is the connection between evidence and memory? And, and I started thinking about how, how one, when one does memory games, how do you remember something? Uh, I don't know if any of uh, has ever tried playing memory games, the way you do it, you put it into a larger story. You can't remember each thing individually, you put it into a larger story. 
And I think memory is very connected to larger stories. Events make sense when they're part of a larger narrative. And then I look back at the, at the Cold War, where we probably had very simplified, very faulty narratives, but you know, battle of freedom versus dictatorship or whatever. And, and um, even small events like the arrest of a dissident or the killing of a priest in Poland would fit into these larger stories and they would have meanings they were part of a larger story and, and those larger stories have fallen apart. Um, we live in a, in a world where it's very hard to define the good that we're trying to get to. Um, and indeed, you know, what, 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 what's the larger idea of history um, that, that we're trying to articulate? Um, so, so that was kind of what the essay was about. And I was like, so what's the role of us as journalists then? Because we want things to be remembered. We don't just collect evidence. We're trying to look for something much bigger. And, and I suppose what I really came to is, is understanding these these hidden connections between events and our role as journalists is to uncover them. And the example that I use actually, first of all, was the case of the last two Nobel Prize winners. So Maria Ressa in the Philippines, Muratov in Russia. These are not countries that are ever put together. No one ever thinks about them in a, a continuum. Um, um, I think I, I did it in my last book. I put them together because I could see that they were all both fighting uh, two very different phenomena, which is the phenomenon of authoritarian tech, which is something Coda Story focus on. And, and Maria Ressa's genius in the Philippines was actually relating her battle with Duterte, the, the recently um, ousted sort of um, populist uh, authoritarian leaning. Recent, leader recently, recently replaced by a worse dictator. Yes, yes, who, who carries on attacking her. But her genius was to understand that, look, her story, which is a very local Filipino story, which maybe not very many people would have cared about, was part of a much larger story about the way digital technology was being used in a very, very new form of oppression. And, and understanding that this, you know, her story was connected to Facebook, connected to what was happening in Russia with the troll farms. And that was, I mean, she's a very good journalist, so she can see these larger stories. So, so that was one example. And, and with Ukraine, um, you know, I think that uh, there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done. There are multiple, multiple larger stories here. There's not just one. There's the overall security story of what you do with sort of nuclear, nuclear powers that have gone very aggressive. So China is the other one that we can think about. How do you defend against them? You're never going to do a humanitarian intervention against Russia or China because they have nukes. So how does a Japan, how does a Taiwan, how does an Australia, how does a Ukraine, how does a Georgia... Um, defend itself against these places. What's the what's the interplay between globalization and security that we can we can work out in in the reaction to the Western reaction to helping Ukraine? Is there actually the beginnings of a larger theory of security? We can talk about post-colonialism. You know, Ukraine in the context of these kind of post-colonial, post-imperial, um, or not very post in Russia's in Russia's case agonies. Um, so the connection there between Ukraine and Ireland and, and bits of Latin America. Again, I don't think enough people have done that. Sadly, audiences in Latin America don't, or many audiences in Latin America don't see their colonial dramas reflected in Ukraine. Um, we can go on and on. You know, there's questions about war crimes and justice for war crimes. And, and my favorite one, what I'm really getting into now, which is the, the legal culpability of propagandists, whether in Syria or around January the 6th or in Russia, which is a question that's now percolating through some judicial thinking. So lots and lots of like things meet. And I think our duty as journalists is to do that. I think, I think the great danger is that, that, that it just becomes plucky little Ukraine fighting big bad Russia, which is an emotional narrative. People will get bored of that because there's only so far you can go on, on kind of that kind of very simplistic emotion. And sadly, that's what a lot of the framing is and ignoring the much larger issues at stake. And if we do over-focus on that, then there's only so many cool speeches that Zelensky can give um, before people will tire. And um, Natalia, and I want to come to fault, you. The journalist faults, is the journal, be the, just be clear, the journalists who think they're doing good will be responsible for this and will burn in media hell. <laughs> Natalia, I want you to both reflect on that. And, you know, you are in Ukraine, uh, whether, you know, you agree that the global media stories boil down to sort of poor Ukraine fighting Russia rather than, um, you know, sort of a larger narrative, a larger storyline. Um, and whether it feels, um, it's certainly from, from the outside, it certainly feel, feels like it's slipping away from, from the headlines. Um, what, it, what it, does it feel like in, uh, in Ukraine? 
Look, uh, first of all, uh, in Ukraine, people are physically tired. I think that's probably the most <laughs> important thing. And there are a lot of other things to do for Ukraine. Of course, the fight is existential. So you really, you know, do wherever it's possible. There is no chance to give up if it's really up to about your existence. You know, uh, I mean, that why you still want to live for some time. Uh, but I um, really uh, think think that uh, the whole idea about you know Ukraine fatigue and things like that, um, they, it's coming from the tradition of this thinking about the uh, the news as an entertainment, and that's for me the root of uh, the problem. Because sorry to say, there was enough of show in Ukraine. There were all kind of the atrocities, all kind of the you know uh, fights and things like that. It just like a, uh, so uh, when I'm sometimes was asked, I think it started in May, by the way, by the Western journalists, like, so what should you do with the Ukraine fatigue? My first question was like, we are there not to entertain you, really, you know. Uh, the second point I do partially and without blaming anybody, but I think it's a bit of the uh, laziness, you know, uh, it was very easy to work in Ukraine for the first months. You just go anywhere and that's a story. You really don't need to put any effort. Reaching the town, you are there, you tweet, I'm in Bucha, that's done. You go, I'm in Kharkiv, you know, it's enough. Um, so I, I mean, I'm in Kiev and, you know, the bombs are there, the Russians are coming, and of course the audience would be boring. But that was very, very simple job to do. You know, with all the credit, I think I have the, somehow the legitimacy to tell that I was there, I, I, I was anywhere, uh, and I really, really appreciate uh, the job of the foreign correspondents working in Ukraine and the risk they are there. But I still think we we have the problems uh, generally, which uh, journalists just and editors agreed on the idea that there is a compassion fatigue, you know, and if the audience is going, we just skip the story. But I do think if we re, uh, rethink the idea of the journalism as a service, some things are unpleasant, medicine is unpleasant, going for Jim, for me, is extremely unpleasant idea, but I find it healthy. So I mean, like consuming important news, uh, it, it should be probably, uh, you know, of course we should be a good storyteller. And I, for instance, I, I still uh, am amazed by what's going on. There is no boring story for me here. You just need to find a different uh, angle. And I think uh, my my general idea, of course, the fatigue uh, and the you know powerlessness. Uh, it's tiring, and uh, the attention could fade away because. You know, especially when you look, look for so many times that there is another global crisis and people are suffering, uh, you feel like you cannot again influence on that, you cannot solve, you see that so many recent wars hasn't been, you know, stopped, people maybe, you know, they became, it was a refugees crisis or things like that later. What I find amazing in Ukraine, uh, and by the way, the Ukrainians, they really do not ask for any compassion. What they really ask is for solidarity. And um, Ukrainians are fighting in all different ways. They are resilient. And uh, there are a lot of inspirational topics for me, you know, really inspirational. And what I believe you can't be really tired of that. So it's really more a, a job of the um, you know, media themselves to find the way, uh, to find your angles, to find the angles which are relevant to your uh, audience, to your population. Uh, and uh, at first, you know, as a lot of Ukrainians, we used to complain a lot, you know, what our government does wrong, what Ukrainian media do wrong. But after some time, I understood that there is a less capacity. There is very little I would do to make Brazilian audience interested. You know, like there is a limit to what Ukrainians can do. It's, if it's matter for Brazil, you know, or if it's matter, we need to do our homework to explain, but somehow it can be just done with the cooperation. So what is interesting again, often the question about fatigue is asked exactly by the editors whose job and duty is to find the way to do it differently for their audience. It's really not my job to find the way to entertain Portuguese audience. I'll find my way, I'll find it. But really 
at this moment, I have the capacity to work for, for the Ukrainian uh, citizens who lack some you know, basic information. So I would, you know, I write for international media, but still I feel like I'm extremely uh, responsible for recording what's happening home and serving uh, my citizens. Yeah, this is um, interesting. You know, in the beginning, when people would ask me, uh, you know, what do you think we should do? We should do for Ukraine, apart from you know saying give them money. I also always um, said give it, give it the gift of attention. Uh, but it is incredible how difficult. It's much easier to give money, to give a donation, than give that gift of attention. And it's very hard to blame kind of lack of attention on air, any any single editor or even you know the structure of news or the um the way the way people consume it and so on so we spent uh, when we first co- founded coda and coda's uh, you know coda's tagline is stay on the story and we really wanted to figure out and it was yemen uh that sort of really kind of pushed me to try and figure out how do we actually keep a crisis in in, in a spotlight um we and imagine you know if it's frustrating to be a ukrainian who is feels like the world is beginning to abandon you what it's like to be a yemeni today where you know years and years on really no one is paying attention or an afghan and so on but um you know and there's so i'm not going to go into the reasons but uh, you know behind behind the lack of attention spans uh, but i think you know the the only solution that we found is this thematic coverage it's kind of what peter talked about sort of finding identifying this um, binding connected connective tissue of stories that can are relatable to to other people as well and it does seem that you know history and um the manipulation of, of history is definitely something that people both find really interesting um and can can relate to and i have to say you know sometimes frustratingly for us no one has done history stories and rewriting of history stories better than sean so sean um, can you just talk about um sort of these issues of because i think you um, I, I think you kind of have really managed to find as, as a consumer and as a reader of your stuff, I think you have found that sweet spot that brings stories alive. Um, and especially with your with your work on kind of identity issues and so on. Can you talk a little bit um, about that topic as that connective, you know, the, the binding kind of storyline? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it's really important, um, you know, in both Russia and Ukraine and in very different ways. And I mean, something, um, you know, just just one thing before I go into that is that, for you know, this this is obviously a war launched by Russia. And one of the things that I think we all need to think about going forward um, in terms of how to keep finding ways to make this relevant to people and keep finding ways to understand this is is how um how the media is going to cover russia uh, in the next uh, few years um when uh it's become since february um a sort of a, a difficult task has become uh much more difficult both for independent russian media and um and foreign media, many of whom have decided to leave, some of whom have been kicked out. Um, there are all these new laws. And so kind of trying to understand what on earth Russia is up to here, the, the toll on Russian society, whether there are, when, when we can expect some feelings of discontent about this war or not, um, that's become a lot harder to report. Um, in, in terms of the, the historical memory, I mean, I think, you know, for, for sort of, I was I was based in Moscow for um, for about a decade until 2018, and 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 was really focused on the way uh, Putin had used history, and particularly this this idea of uh, victory in the Second World War um, to sort of create this real building block of identity for Russians, and in, to the to the point that I felt by the time I left Russia in 2018 that this war victory had almost become like a kind of secular religion in Russia, um, perhaps in many ways more important, certainly much more promoted than the actual Orthodox church. Um, when you watch television, when you read about what children were being taught in schools and so on. Um, and it's been sort of extraordinary to see in the last four years, how this has just metastized even further. Um, and, you know, of course, um, 
Putin's words about fighting Nazis in Ukraine are disingenuous. And, and of course, there are a, a, a large number of, of sort of other ideological motivations, um, both in terms of uh, worries about NATO threats, in terms of a kind of post-colonial disdain for, for Ukraine as a real country. But this, 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 in terms of selling this to, to the Russian people, I think, um, you know, this idea of, of, of Russia is somehow you know, against all the evidence, but, 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 but somehow the current Russian action being this continuation of, of, of the glorious uh, past of 1941 to 1945 um, is, is, is very powerful in Russia. At the same time, I think what it's, what it's been really noticeable in Ukraine this, this year um, is that through all of the kind of um, tragedy and tears and, and pain that you know, the sense of Ukrainian identity um, feels to me, and I'd, I'd be curious what, what Natalia thinks about this, but, but it feels to me like it's, it's come together in a way that was not there before, that, you know, Maidan uh, was perhaps the start of this journey of creating a unified Ukrainian identity, but there were always complicated uh, disagreements about what particular parts of history meant, about what particular uh, figures and symbols meant, and that you know many people felt Ukrainian, but exactly how they thought that should manifest itself was very different. And it seems to me that Putin's done an amazing job uh, at kind of giving people a, a much bigger box to put themselves in and say, you know, comfortably say I'm a Ukrainian patriot and I'm anti-Russian um, and, and many people who perhaps would have said that with an enormous number of caveats or would have said it in a different way uh, 10 years ago or even a year ago um, and now um, uh, are now sort of um, you know very comfortable saying that so I think there are these two processes going on in in the two countries um, related to kind of the views of history and the sense of national identity. And they're going in very different directions, but I think they're kind of very important for how this develops over the next uh, months and years, as well as the military situation, obviously. Natalia, do you want to respond to that or should I? No, I, I, can, I, I can speak, but I have a bit, it's not like I have a different idea. I would go on. Um, I just think the war, uh, it didn't bring something new. It's accelerated what was there and showed um, also as any extreme situation, what really matters. Uh, but my feeling that it's uh, what is important to stress uh, that if you speak about the Ukrainian identity, it's not really about a history. It's really about the vision of the country people want to leave, in fact. Uh, and it's more or less the agreement that we, we should have the country where people have choice to choose their future and the choice how they can live, doesn't matter what. It could be a different choice of different people, uh, but it's up to them to choose. So it could be different for, for, for Kharkiv, it could be different for these uh, church believers from uh, this ethnic, you know, for this group. And I, I really, um, you know, more or less became sure in that uh, within, especially talking within the last months to a lot, a lot of people that it's really, you, in fact, being Ukrainian is a political choice apart from is this ethnic group which is targeted, uh, but for me, it's it's really because I'm very cautious about the idea of identity in the modern world, you know, with the whole history, language. Uh, I'm speaking about the cultural identity. Uh, and what I really feel that what is matters is the way the country is governed for the Ukrainians, but it also the part of the Ukrainian identity, of the political identity that people hear. And it's not something which happened really in 2014 as well. I do think that the, all the 30 years of the uh, independence of Ukraine played, played crucial role in the way society it is, because it's also very much generational. It's, it, you know, it, it, because it's really about the generation which really do not remember Soviet Union. <laughs> like has nothing to do with that and even do not understand why the Russia is bringing this you know like old uh, ghost 
to their uh, way they want to 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 live in future yeah and 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 neither do many people in the west and and beyond the west as well and uh, you know the the tricky thing is that the ukrainian this incredible emergence of the ukrainian identity that we have all or those of us who have watched um the war and the last the last decade and a half really closely um have witnessed it doesn't really help to keep ukraine it can all or it can only do so much to keep to keep Ukraine in the global spotlight and Ukraine needs the global spotlight in order to achieve the kind of future that shapes the identity that is being shaped right but, so um how do we like how do we make caring about Ukraine part of the like Western liberal identity, people, people in the West, like what stories as media do we tell people? And Peter, you mentioned colonialism. And I think that's a really, really interesting one, because I'm often really struck by how the conversation, you know, Russia just basically, um, Russia's, Russia's colonial reputation as a colonial power doesn't really extend beyond this region. Ask any Georgian and they'll tell you, yes, Russia is an empire, it was an imperial power. And they colonized us but you know i i don't think that's how people think of russia in western europe or in africa and in asia so and um why is that and whether it's possible to change it and um is that one way of making people of keeping ukraine in the spotlight yeah from my very superficial research and it's very superficial um <clears throat> in a lot of what's known for better or worse the global south the the uh it's 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 seen as you know america's fault and uh it's american imperialism which is the root of this so i'd, I'd like i'd love to interrogate that actually i wonder whether it's the same in different countries i remember the, didn't the president of chile come out recently and say oh like to be a leftist now means on you to be on ukraine's side i know there are countries in latin america which have become very russia skeptic partly because of their support for venezuela so as in Russia's support for Venezuela, which has triggered all sorts of problems to Venezuela's neighbors. So I, I think we have to be nuanced. Uh, but yeah, it's the sort of, I mean, the, the, I'm helping organize a, a literary festival in Lviv between October the 5th and the 9th, extending a cordial invitation uh, to anyone who wants to come. There'll be a lot of online events. And that's one of the things we really want to do. I mean, I think that's the sort of work that actually starts with kind of, in this case, with, with quite sort of uh cultural leadership opinion so british library type people i think writers have a huge role to play in this sort of much slower reframing this is not a fast process you know in in populations where in a very deep level for very historically understandable reasons um europe and the west are seen as the great colonizers you're not just going to click your fingers and go haha look at this it's going to be a very slow process and for that sort of thing books are very important and novels and films are very important and, and so that kind of level, I don't think this is a quick thing that you can change. This is not like a, a PR solution that you can just, you know, just do overnight. Uh, so that's that kind of journalism, you know, literary journalism maybe would play a very important role here. Uh, looking actually how literatures, post-colonial literatures develop. It's very interesting looking at writers like Yuri Andruhovich, who's a Ukrainian writer whose early novels were all about this, this colonial dilemma and the dilemma of it, the extent to which you're also sort of bought by the colonial ruler and become part of the system. It's a very complicated process. It's not, it's not simple at all. And, and, and looking at way that experience has um, plays out in South Asia and Latin America would be really, really interesting. So that, that's one thing, but, but again, there, there are multiple things. There really are multiple issues here. Uh, some which are much more short-term, the, the security one or the war crimes one. Um, we mentioned, um, uh, Sean, Sean mentioned being in, in Russia a long time and, and really, we have to understand that what Russia is doing is the Russian way of war that we saw in, in Chechnya, you know, the sort of like raising cities and slaughtering civilians as a tactic in, in Syria. And it's now happening again. Really important to bring those strands together. What's happening now is not an accident. Georgia. And, 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 and who could forget about Georgia? Sorry. And, and really bringing those strands together. So when you do, you know, Natalia and I are working on a big project together, and, and that's kind of the aim, what we're trying to do as we cover something like Mariupol, we want to bring in voices from Grozny and from Aleppo. So, so I think those sort of things are very important. And that, that relates directly to war crimes, culpability, norms. Are we, are we going to accept this form of warfare in the 21st century or not? So, so there's much more immediate things to do. Uh, the colonial one, I think, is a slow burn. Does it feel, yeah, go, go on, Sean. 
Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I think one thing that I think will change now and will be and will be part of that slow change uh, is is in, in terms of the way we cover Ukraine. I mean, first of all, is is clearly it's just but for even if there is Ukraine fatigue, even if um, people are not as interested as they were in February for many years to come, people are going to be much more interested in Ukraine than they ever were before. And, you know, when I used to be based in Moscow um, and I would come maybe a couple of times a year to do stories in Kiev, and every time I would uh, speak with government officials or all kinds of people, there was a kind of a frustration that like, why is Ukraine only being covered by Moscow correspondents? Like you're coming here, even if you are writing these sort of mostly critical stories about Russia, you're still by being based in Russia, you have this kind of uh, Moscow prism in the way that you look at Ukraine. Um, and I always used to be a bit, you know, annoyed by that and think it was totally unfair. But in retrospect, you know, clearly that's a problem. Uh, clearly it's a problem that, you know, and I think it's a mix of a bunch of things. It's partly also declining newsroom budgets and so on. But, you know, you had this country, one of the biggest countries in Europe, constant fascinating political upheavals really interesting geopolitical location and you know you had a few wires correspondents in kiev you had uh you know chris miller who is an american journalist who was based in kiev and, and pretty much in terms of major uh newspapers uh i think maybe there's a bbc correspondent but you know there weren't many correspondents who were there and I think that's going to change, you know, with The Guardian, we've we've hired uh, a great journalist uh, to be based in Kiev, Isabel Koshiv. I saw the Washington Post has set up a Kiev bureau. I think the New York Times is doing the same. You know, maybe that's, maybe you might argue that's a little bit late, but I think as a way to sort of look at Ukraine, um, both, you know, both to increase the number of Ukrainian voices, but also to, if you're talking about foreign correspondence, to to look at the country from the position of Kiev rather than from the position of flying in from Moscow, I can imagine that that is also both going to increase the amount of coverage and is going to lead to a sort of more nuanced and perhaps a different slant of coverage. The problem was always about the cliche. We somehow get used to the, the worst. I mean, every single country is different. However, still we kind of looked at the template of the wars we have in the 90s in 2000s. And I think after the Second World War, um, you know, despite everything, I, I kind of, I covered other conflicts globally, but really this kind of an obvious fight against the sovereignty of another country, there were not so many cases. Like if we're really speaking about a bigger country invading, you know, like there were, we can speak to Kuwait and the other cases, uh, but really of this scale not. So it's easier to go to quite a usual um, template. Um, and that's became a problem, the frame. And I think also this idea about the fatigue and powerlessness is coming from that way, because it's very rare when the wars are happening in the democratic countries. So usually you would focus on some persecutions and some other things. And there is a particular way you report the, you know, the authoritarian countries, the role of the government. Uh, so th there is a system in place. And all of a sudden there is this war in Ukraine, which is fight, fought in the democratic country, where in some way the people speak the same, the government says the same about the solutions. Uh, there is the parliament, there is the press. And uh, it's still kind of, covered partially as if it's a, like an opposition voice to something bigger. Um, and I think this is the reason why um, it's very difficult to uh, report, not, not difficult, it's actually very easy to report the war crimes compared to, for instance, um, you know, places where there is very difficult access. So all the patterns of the international investigations are created in the closed spaces where you really get into, you know, the whole task is just to the, get to the place. And there would be a couple of the organizations uh, working there and telling this story. In Ukraine, all of a sudden people do not know, uh, do not know how to cover the war in a very open country. Uh, 
where you can communicate with the government, when you can't, when the country is functioning. So you still started to do all the stories about, you know, ref refugees, IDPs, and then understand it's something different. You know, I think also it's a trap, the good trap for us, uh, which I hope Russia would be caught because everything which has happened, of course, in Chechnya and Syria is happening in Ukraine. But there, it was still a matter of a different country. So, uh, you know, there was no, was less case for a place for the uh, uh, investigation uh, because there was always these questions and the moral dilemma. Can you really get into the sovereignty of another country? So for instance, there is still, doesn't matter, we don't like this government, it's maybe authoritarian, but it's still legit. Aren't we supporting the opposition? You know, uh, do we have a sovereignty as another state to, you know, do more? And in case of Ukraine, it's different because it was an attack on the sovereign country with a functioning government, uh, not a kind of an opposition to the authoritarian leader. And I feel that the still, you know, attitude and pattern, how a lot of internationals uh, deal is based on this, on, on kind of on, on, on different uh, terrain. Uh, it's getting better, it's getting better, but um, still I think it, it's something to, 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 to first of all agree that it's a different way we used to cover the wars. They are all the same for the people who suffer, but politically they organize differently. And shortly on the colonialism, I fully agree on that, uh, that it's very critical. The Russian imperialism is partially the responsible for that. We didn't speak about that for a long time. And uh, the big task for Ukraine, it's really the task for Ukraine to reach out to the, um, you know, to the global south. Uh, I, I feel it's critically important because for me, uh, you know, being more politically on the left, you know, spending time in the Arab world, you know, I mean, knowing quite a lot of people in, uh, in opposition to their governments in Brazil, elsewhere, I feel really that it's critically unfair that Ukraine isn't treated, you know, as... As, as the ones of, of their cause. And I do That's think right. nobody that has to tell them. Yeah. That is so, my, my next question was about Global South. We do have some questions coming in, keep them coming, we'll get to them in a minute. But my next question was going to be about Global South because it is also extraordinary to me when you are in the region, you know, things feel very black and white. The minute you slightly step out, a step away and get, you know, look at the bigger picture, it is extraordinary how many um, countries and people around the world who for whom Ukraine should be much more relatable um, are in fact um, either indifferent or uh, consciously choosing Russia's side um, and seeing this as a sort of as a Western war. So, um, and this is to all three of you, um, if you have got any, you know, you have, have any thoughts, like what do we do about that? Interesting, Natalia, that you say reach out to the global south as, um, you know, Ukraine as the state, anything else? I don't want to overtake the time, but I have like a short idea. Uh, you know, I thought that the global solidarity uh, was often based on this kind of negative mode of enemy of my enemy is my friend, you know, that there are the, these bad guys and we are together because there are these bad guys. And I think it's a time to find the kind of the positive bond between the countries in a way that uh, we're fighting for something good together. Uh, because I, I, in this regard, for Ukrainians, for a lot of Ukrainians, the painful story is, of course, the Pope, uh, you know, who uh, is a, a, a great person, what I understand, but he, even him, because I talk to, I mean, I'm not religious, but I talk to a lot of religious uh, leaders, people, those who have access, and for them, it's also very pain, painful, for instance, to observe that still even the Pope would treat the war as, you know, two big imperialist countries, you know, like as two imperialist That's countries right. fight. However, it's a country, it's a fight between the empire and the colony. And I do think in this way, even the Pope turns to this idea of an enemy of my enemy, instead of, you know, being concentrated on the uh, rethinking the freedom, rethinking the democracy, rethinking, you know, like not rethinking anyway, but how we find the new way to implement it you know, in the modern way, in the digital world. And that's where my thinking would go, first of all. Peter, you look like you have something to say. 
Um, um, no, I'm just like, really enjoying this. I mean, I think a very important part of this is, of course, strengthening Ukrainian voices in the world. So we have Natalia, um, but, you know, the more Ukrainians get to speak for themselves, um, not just in reporting, but also in opinion places and on talk shows and all that sort of thing is important. I think in Germany, for example, you still have a case that, you know, the situation is, is described, especially on German talk shows, from the point of view of either pro-Russian um, German uh, pundits or, or maybe liberal Russians, but still not with Ukrainians very often. Um, I think that really, really needs to change. Um, and I think that is changing. I mean, I, I, I'm so glad to finally see uh, this incredible crop of Ukrainian writers getting some international publicity. I've actually been, I try to force my editors at the London Review of Books for so many years to, to focus on this. I think the literary mm -hmm. classes as well as the media classes have a huge responsibility to counterbalance what Sean was talking about, this, this blind spot that we had for several decades about what is Ukraine. And they were just completely uninterested. They just ignored all my, all my pleas, which was really, really sad. And, and I think the literary classes also have a responsibility in creating uh, an informational landscape where we knew so much, so little about Ukraine and, and helps in their own very small way, create the conditions that made Russia's invasion easier. I'm really glad to see that changing. I'm really glad to see um, this whole crop of Ukrainian writers suddenly being translated into English, writing wonderful essays everywhere. So look, we're not really in a world where, where we have to depend on, on the sort of uh, the tough foreign correspondent roaming around um, war zones with a hip flask and um, uh, a sort of a really, really unhappy childhood in a Catholic boarding school. We, we can really move beyond that. Um, I mean, the work The Guardian and Sean do is remarkable, but, but we're really not at that stage of journalism, I think. But, um, you know, we talked about the um, we talked about the global south and the need to the need to be able to relate um, uh, to those audiences uh, for Ukraine. You know, the need for Ukraine to explain how Ukraine's plight is not all that different from from the plight of some of the post colonial um, countries in Africa and in Asia and Latin America. Um, but how do we reach the audiences in the West who are also, if you think about it, should be natural allies? And, you know, Sean, one that I'm thinking about is the, you know, the Guardian sort of reading audience, uh, the anti-war anti coalition people. It always amazes me that the NATO argument is so strong. The argument used kind of, Mm, the argument that introduces doubt into, into this, like who is right and who is wrong in this war, um, is the argument of NATO expansion. Um, so I wonder, like, what, what, like, how do you, how do you talk, like, what stories do you tell um, that audience to, to address that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are different parts of that audience. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, my unscientific guess uh, is that a large part of it has at the minimum perhaps not done a 180 degree turn but at the minimum has changed their views a bit or tempered their views a bit uh, since February because you know what for, for all that it's it's absolutely correct that we should see this in in the uh, sort of long period of the last 10 perhaps the last 30 perhaps the last hundreds of years uh, and that, you know, this is the reinvasion and not the invasion and so on and so on. I mean, there was something qualitatively different about what happened in February. I mean, this is, it, it just, it reached a point that is very, very hard to defend, even if you were previously sympathetic to Russia. And whereas with 2014, um, you know, you could just about start to make some arguments without being a complete lunatic about what happened there. Uh, with with what happened since February, I think a lot of people who previously would have said, well, you know, we may not be fans of Putin, but um, have suddenly had to like remove that but because because they've seen what's happening. And then I think you have, you know, you have a, a group of that audience who are who are deep into the conspiracy zone and, you know, everything that happened in Ukraine is the result of the State Department and, you know, th there's a global conspiracy and so on and so on. Uh, and that audio, that that segment is, is probably going to be harder to reach. And, and you, perhaps you do have still in the middle um, some people who, who we do need to think about, uh, you know, the things that Natalia was saying about, uh, 
a, partly a job for Ukrainians themselves, partly a job for foreign media, perhaps, about trying to tell this story in, um, yeah, in, in ways that make people understand that, that this is not about, uh, you know, Joe Biden against Vladimir Putin. This is, this is something different. And I think, I mean, I don't know, my, I mean, I, perhaps um, I'm, I'm giving the media too much credit, but I think people have been telling the story in those ways. And I think it has been changing people's views. And I think, you know, Natalia is absolutely right um, about this kind of negative um, solidarity that we had before. I mean, you know, you would, with the exception of 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 of, uh, of 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 a few people, few crazy people, perhaps, uh, you would very rarely, when you're talking about Russia to to people in Germany or other European countries, hear people say, you know, I love Vladimir Putin. I think everything he's done in Russia. Right, is but you fantastic. still hear things like, you know, I was, I happened to be um, speaking to at a at a panel with the um, um, advisor to the Dutch Prime Minister um, a month ago now, so still in the midst of very very active fighting, more than a month ago, who said we need to find an off ramp for Putin. So that's a big gap between the way this war is perceived in, you know. Uh, in the region and the way it's perceived in the West. I mean, that's that's a slightly different question, isn't it? That's about, you know, is there a way, is there a way to, I mean, there's one view that's like this war either ends with the defeat of Ukraine and perhaps Europe or it ends with the defeat of Putin. And, you know, that's, uh, uh, and, and there's another view that, you know, perhaps there is still a way to have an off-ramp, which seems pretty unlikely at this point. But I think in terms of just where the sympathies lie and where the solidarity lies, even a lot of those people who are saying we need to find an off ramp are perhaps much less uh, amenable to sort of talking about this in you know both sidesism as they might have been six mm. months ago. Is my feeling. And just in case any of the audiences are not sure, a question for all three of you, and if you can be brief in your answer, you say it's not about this. This war is not about Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin. So, Sean, to you first, what is this war about? I mean, I don't know how you can be brief with that answer. I think it's about so many different things. You know, I, there's a lot, there are a lot of people who that, you know, I've read, I've read very many different things about, you know, this is the one reason, or this is not the reason, you know, this is nothing to do with NATO. This is everything to do with NATO. This is all to do with a disdain for Ukrainians as, as a nation and not believing they're real. This is Putin gone mad in the bunker over two years of COVID. This is Russian society built up on propaganda for years and years. This is, you know, Putin being scared of a democratic country next to him. And I think, you know, exact measuring exactly which part of which element is uh, in percentage terms is quite difficult, but I wouldn't pull out one reason. I think that the, the like there was a basically a kind of for me, it seems there was a kind of perfect storm of, of many different reasons that have, have led to this decision. That was not an answer, Sean. <laughs> All right, I'll come to you, I Peter. have one. Yeah, Peter, sorry, go on. What is this war about? Okay, I don't Peter, have one either. I would have said the same. I do have. I, I just read the go, article go exactly on this. Because okay, for good. me, I do think this is the war really about different ways of governance and to show that it's possible in the very same part of the world. Uh, because if you really start to, and that's not something I favor that much, you know, to make this kind of comparison all the time, what, why Ukrainians are different from Russia, what makes them different. And then you can speak about the language identity, you know, religion, heroes. Uh, however, I would still say that what uh, Russia doesn't really like in Ukraine, it's the way it's governed in a way that it's governed with the elections and with the will of people. It doesn't matter what it would be, because within this last eight years, we had totally different governments with different ideologies, you know, not really opposite, but kind of, you know, one more probably was more conservative, more identity politics, uh, nationalistic, another was like more centrist and even like a bit liberal, you know, it doesn't matter what, but it's it just was chosen to be different. So when you really see the, the, the most critical thing, uh, what makes the country's difference and what actually people see being different by the way they want to run it. Russia wants really like how to say it, more or less a hierarchical authoritarian way. So for me, the analogy for today, uh, without using kind of this off ramp, and I can go, I, I won't go for too long about that. But I, I only think that like, look at the, um, 
the closest analogy for, for me today comes is like Northern and Southern Korea. They are even the same kind of nation, you know, not really like Ukrainians and the Russians are different people from different ethnic groups. But at the same time, within the years, this country developed apart. There is a different society which used to live differently. And there is no way that somebody in Seoul would buy into anything, you know, uh, the Pyongyang would do or vice versa right, right away. So that's something which had already happened within the last decades uh, with different countries. And uh, it's there and that's it. It's just too, so I do see the way of coexistence of these two countries. And uh, I see the way that the societies are just, and that, that, the, that the war uh, which, we, um, which we're fighting. Then we can go for a lot of other things on top of that, or which are developing from this analogy for me. Uh, but, but it's really, about the way of the governance. Society. Peter, you said Sean's themselves. answer was not an answer. What is the answer? No, I was sympathizing. It was, it was, I, I did swiftly add that I'd probably do the same thing. Um, I agree with Natalia that one of the, the things that really, um, I can't quite answer in my head, not in a clean way, is this incredible question, Russia and Ukraine, a lot of shared, history, a colonial history in many ways, but, but, or in, in all ways really, but, but a lot of shared history. Neither of them on any part of EU accession, very similar 1990s in the sense that, you know, certain amount of lawlessness, corruption, gangsterism. And with really with this so much in common, one country goes in one direction and chooses to. Let's, 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 let's not avoid this question. Russia chose to go authoritarian. It really did. I mean, it voted for Putin. It voted for Putin when there was still a chance to vote for someone else. It was a choice. It was like, we need the strong hand. That was very popular in public opinion. While Ukraine goes this completely different direction. And, and we could look at everything from the, the, the presence of oil or just imperial baggages, but it's so fascinating to see how they go in these different directions. But again, I think that's a universal story. I think we're going through a period now of really asking what the hell is democracy? I live in the United States of America and I, have, I, I actually work at a faculty at Johns Hopkins University that was basically dedicated to answer this question. So it's a lot of academics, a lot of very interesting conversations about what is democracy? I mean, we know it's institutions, but it's this weird thing called discourse. It's a set of values, it's civic relations. You know, we had all these assumptions in the Cold War that it was like free markets, free people, you know, whatever, like, you know, a bunch of kind of like simple institutional uh, coda, dare I say. But now um, we realize something much, much, much more complex. And again, then it's, you know, the Ukraine-Russia war is, is about that, about what is democracy? Because it's not just institutions. I've had so many people in, in DC lecture me that Ukraine is not a real democracy because it has a weak civil service. And I'm like, you're missing the point. It's got more democracy than many other places that might have some of those formal things to their advantage. And it has many other institutions, formal and semi-formal, which we don't understand. And we don't factor in when we think about democracy. And, and so, you know, Natalia talks about governance and she's written about that beautifully in The Atlantic recently, um, really trying to understand what are the wellsprings of, of an organization of a democratic society. For all of Ukraine's problems with the court system, et cetera, it's got all these other what we refer to as civil society institutions. I hate the term civil society. I think it's a very lazy term for stuff that we can't categorize um, that are so vital and that actually we might well be missing in, in the West. So again, this is a universal thing. What do we mean by democracy? But it isn't just like, you know, you three- So we've got a question for you on the Peter, Peter, I want still, Let me tell you, there is something I want to add because Peter said like, he doesn't know why the countries went apart. Last year, we've done the really long documentary series on the Ukrainian nineties. Uh, which were devoted to the 30 years of independence. And what we understood, it was a very traumatic experience, but somehow you, Ukrainians managed to overcome and find that they get something in the end, they get something. They kind of left it, they lived through that. Why in the end, Russia, Russians felt, and there was a play by the state, by propaganda, you know, coming back to this revanchism in a way that we lost, we didn't gain, and which is more or less based on the um, uh, empire sentiment. And I do mm -hmm. think that Ukraine is spare from that, which yeah. allowed it to move further, mm -hmm. because there was nothing really that exciting to look back. 
and the Russian government, the Russian propaganda, wherever who decided in Russia and partial society, made made this society to look past instead of looking forward. So for me, that would be one of the root causes, as you said, the quota is looking at the root causes, but one of the root causes where the break happened, that after 30 years, Ukrainians feel that they gain something, something they want to and preserve, the that they, and somebody well, who just feel like there is nothing see. in the future, all the mm -hmm. good is in the past, and I that's do, I'm, our I'm, defense. Yeah, I'm, I mean, very much tied to that, and um, um, and to the kind of the, the 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 bigger question that all of you have have worked with on, you know, what are the sort of these big questions that Ukraine that all of us are grappling with from, you know, the Philippines to um, uh, to Colombia, and like how Ukraine is helping to to answer some of these questions. Uh, but we have a we have a question from the audience along kind of along the same lines: Has the assault on Ukraine shown us? where in the West, that despite the claims of the Canadian Freedom Convoy, remember the truckers, you might have been too distracted by the war to remember them, and their likes, uh, that we are more free than we had thought, does it not also challenge us, challenge us to rethink what we do with that freedom? That's um, a question from, from the audience. So does Ukraine challenge us to rethink what we do with our freedom? Any jump in, whoever wants that's to. That's got to be a question for Peter. Yeah, Peter? that's all that as well. <laughs> Have Ukrainians made us rethink what to do with our freedom? Is that the question? Yes. The, the, does I, Ukraine I know, show know, that we, do, we as in the Western, does Ukraine show that Western societies are more free than they had thought? And, um, should that freedom be treated differently? Okay, I mean, look, the word freedom is a is a really messed up one. Um, you know, there's there's even a there's even a quite is in that book by that that American writer, what's his name again, called Freedom, where he unpacks the word freedom for hundreds and hundreds of pages in novelistic form. So I'm not going to go down the sort of rabbit hole of trying to find what freedom is. Um, but something really strange happens to you when you cross the border from Poland into Ukraine. Something I've experienced over and over and over and over, which is stuff that in our words that in our world are abstract like democracy or freedom or values which is another one that makes me always want to grow up myself um suddenly become real experienced and concrete um you know we fight for our values well in ukraine they literally are fighting for their values and that happens over and over and over a lot of, a lot of with a lot of small things as well i mean you start to look at the sky differently in ukraine because it's a source of danger and hope and all these things. So the, the, the land around you and the architecture around you starts to be filled with huge political meaning. Um, and so Ukraine is this very interesting territory where, where the metaphorical becomes literal, where, where the figurative becomes lived experience and built experience of them. And, and I really recommend people to go to just experience and it really hits you the moment you, you cross the border. And it's very strange when you, when you come out again, how this very sadness, because you know that like you've just left a, ter a territory of danger to one of safety. And it's just a silly border that was in the way. And, and I always look up at the sky and suddenly you realize you're looking at the sky in Poland in a different way that you looked at it in Ukraine because you were looking constantly at the sky and a little bit of fear in Ukraine. And you leave and suddenly the sky is free of fear, but also meaningless. Um, and I don't know, I, 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 I think Ukraine is absolutely vital now as a place where all these abstract terms become real. Thank you. It's very unfortunate, you know, I'm just probably to add on this practical, you know, there are some positive things, how you feel these things. Uh, and just given the example of uh, what people said, I'm just sitting on the spot, you know, like exactly where I am in Slavutich, it's a town on the very north of Ukraine, close to Chernobyl. And the lady who was sitting here before me, I was doing the interview, they spent one month, almost one month in March, um, in the basement in the village near town of Chernihiv where around 370 people stayed uh, and they were really deprived physically. Like they are normal. The lady works for the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. She's an engineer. Another was the head of the tourist agency, you know, like the, just as usual people as you can imagine. 
And uh, they were really technically, they went out from this village, they were passing by, but they were deprived of their liberty for one month. And there were very concrete meaning of that world, you know, when they got free. Uh, but I should say that what is interesting for me to to uh, to add on that it's it's really like a lot of um, again like it's a very unfortunate what's happening and but it's true when things are existential they really have the meaning so in Poland when I go out and I see the field which is like green the first thing I see like oh the crops would be there in the south in Ukraine when I've been before, uh, they probably are mined and you won't walk there any longer. And that's how you feel about a very basic thing, you know, like the green crops in the village, in the countryside. Uh, but what I find interesting about the rethinking the freedom, it's uh, maybe more about Ukrainian society rather than something global. Um, that, for instance, for a while, Ukrainians, because they were colonized, so it's kind of a rebellious a nation, a nation. So our freedom was always freedom from somebody, uh, you know, like from the Tsar, from the uh, from the king or anybody or communist party. It was something rebellious. What I started to feel now that people more refer in Ukraine to freedom as the right to choose and right to decide. It's a freedom of responsibility that we are responsible for how we want to live. We are responsible for our community. And I'm really, really enjoying that. I think it's fragile because the war is a war. It's, you know, it's fragmenting societies. It's toxic. Doesn't matter what. I mean, I, 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 would, I won't be the person who would search something good in that. However, I still try to find the silver lining. And I do think that this rebellious freedom is moving to the freedom of responsibility for your choice. Uh, uh, which I do think would be very, you know, fruitful for the future of, of the country and the, of the Natalia, th th we are out of time, but what an absolutely amazing note to end on. Uh, very inspirational and very thought provoking. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, very quickly, a shameless plug, but there is a question about what is authoritarian tech that Peter mentioned earlier. Go to codastory.com and you will find out. Sorry, we don't have time to address it. Thank you so much, Sean, Natalia, Peter. Thank you so much for participating. Many, many thanks to the British Library and the events team for organizing this and to all of you for attending. And I hope you'll stay cool. Thank you. Thank you.